Hello everyone and welcome to my third of three videos on this, the Nikon D70. In the first video we talked about what everything is, in the second video we talked about how to do everything except for what's behind the menu button. So that's what this video is going to be about, the menu button. So if you push the menu button, it will bring up these menus. Before we jump into what everything is, I'm going to talk about how to navigate it. Enter with menu, then you use the up and down button to switch between the tabs, which are on the left hand side here. When you're at a tab you want to enter, you push the right button and it will take you into one of these items. And then you can use the up and down button to select it. And then you can use the right tab to go into the uh, function adjustment so that you can then decide, make an adjustment to a setting. So that's how the navigation on this works. As we begin each tab, I will do my best to remember uh, to tell you which page on the manual the tab correspond that you can find the tab information in, so that if you have the manual or want to read along as I describe some of these things, you can do that. We're going to start here in the playback menu, which is on manual page 123. And your items are delete, folder, rotate, slideshow, slide image, and print setup. Some of these are pretty straightforward. We're going to breeze right through this. Delete will allow you to delete selected photos on your CF card or all photos on your CF card. If you go in here, you can see all of the photos I took while I was, you know, futzing around in the second video and that I'm wearing a white t-shirt tonight. Exciting, I know. So uh, anyway, you can select OK to delete a photo. Which one's OK? Maybe just the delete button? Nope. Oh yeah, yeah, nah, I don't know. Anyway, you can delete them in there. You can also just delete by hitting playback and then going in to hit delete. Yes, so anyway, go back into menu. The big thing with delete is that you can delete your entire CF card if you needed to do that, and that would be if that's a thing you need to do. Hit menu, you can back out of that a little bit. Oops. Ooh, descriptions of the different menus. I didn't I just discovered that by accident. So if you're on the tabs and you hit the left button, you can see the names of the menus. Okay, anyway, uh, next up, playback, playback folder. Okay, so this was the folder one, playback folder. Basically, are you going to, when you, when you play back your images, do you want it to play back just from the current folder or from all? This could be useful if, let's say, you have photos from two different events, like you shot two weddings in the last week, and one wedding is in one folder and one wedding is in the other, and you don't want to share photos from the other wedding with the people whose wedding you're showing photos of right now. So you can select whether you want to just have one folder be played back or all of them. Next up is the rotate, rotate tall. Okay, basically what this means is you, you're, if you have a, a portrait photo, will it display sideways or up and down? I think that applies to both the camera and your uh, computer. So it's always a little bit hard to tell with the old cameras exactly what that applies to. Next up is slideshow. And this allows you to start a slideshow right now. And you can also select how long you want each of the images to play for, two, three, five, or 10 seconds. So if you had a bunch of photos on here from that wedding and you wanted to just run through the photos that you already took on a slideshow at the reception or something, never a good idea to show people photos without having first vetted them. Anyway, you could do that, just connect this to a computer and or to a, to a an analog TV if you can find one and you can do that or play them back on your screen with this slideshow delay. Next up is hide images and this will allow you to select images to hide that will be on your memory card but not play not displayed when you play them back. And this next one is print set, print setup so uh, I'm not going to lie, I've never hooked a camera up to a printer to print directly from it because I always want to go back and clean up my photos and do a little bit of processing on them first. But this will, if you want to print directly from your camera, allow you to do that. I'm not even sure if cameras in the last five or so years have come with this function. Maybe a few have. Um, but at any rate, if you had a Nikon printer that you wanted to connect this to, you could do that. 
yes, that's that's everything in the playback menu. So next up, we're going to go to the shooting menu, which is on manual page 132. So the, the first option here is going to be optimized, followed by long exposure noise reduction, quality, size, white balance, and ISO. Some of these we've already seen, but we'll talk about them anyway. Optimize image, normal, vivid, sh uh, sharper, softer, direct, direct something must be uh, optimizing it to go direct to the printer. That's my best guess. So these are your different options. Normal is going to be the standard normal image settings. It's going to give you an image that is as faithful as possible to the real world. Vivid will up the color saturation and probably contrast a little bit as well. Sharper will sharpen the image with some now 20 some odd year old sharpening algorithms. Uh, softer will soften the image again using very old algorithms and then as I think we've determined direct print. Oh yeah, now that you can actually see the whole thing should optimize it to go to a printer. In general, my recommendation is going to be just to leave this on normal. If you increase the saturation and contrast, you can never decrease it, at least not effectively. If you have something normal, you can always then go back and increase the saturation and contrast. But if you start with a lower contrast, you can darken those shadows and brighten those highlights. If you start there, you can't get that information back. So if you're looking for this as a tool to, to improve your photography and learn how to do some editing, you definitely want to leave this on normal. Next up is long exposure noise reduction on or off. I tend to leave this off because your this will do noise reduction on your long exposures. Long exposures tend to have higher noise in the images. However, you're going to hear this a lot in this video. The algorithms for this are 20 something years old now. Any free photo editing software, or if you got something like Affinity, which is as of this video's recording, I think like $50, uh, really affordable, then you're going to have access to better tools than are in this camera. So just leave this to off and do this kind of work in post, you'll have better results. Next up is image quality. This is the exact same thing as we talked about with this quality button right here, but we can access it in the menu system. Raw only, JPEG, uh, JPEG fine, normal, basic, raw plus JPEG. And in the in, in this one, uh, I guess it'll only give you fine full size. Probably have to go in here to adjust it. But this is a good way to access those image settings. As you heard me say in the second video, recommend just shooting raw and editing in post. You will get a lot more editability out of your images and a lot more control over the final results. So you uh, will probably be happier with it, even if it takes a little bit more time to do the editing. Uh, image size. Okay, so with image quality, if you select one of the JPEGs, then you can come down here to image size and select between large, medium, and small, which are full sensor, 2240 by 1440, which is what, like 3 megapixels, and 1504 by 1000, which is 1 1.5 megapixels. So those are your JPEG sizes right there. They don't apply to RAW because RAW is always full sensor only. White balance is the exact same white balance options we saw. Now, there's a difference here. You might notice that there's a triangle here instead of an OK. So when we selected tungsten, well, incandescent, or flu fluorescent, or any of these direct sunlight flash in the second video with the use of the white balance button here, it gave us one option. But if we go into incandescent and hit the right button on the control pad, now it allows us to increase up to plus three or minus three the strength of the correction. Okay, So if we select tungsten with the current setting, then what's or incandescent with the current setting, then what we're going to get is whatever we have set here will be applied when we select it through the white balance button. Okay, And the same applies for all of these others. Fluorescent, we can adjust more magenta because we have very strongly fluorescent lights or less magenta because we have less green fluorescent lights. Different colors of fluorescent lights also have different green green hues. So if you find that you need to adjust your white balance manually, you can come in here to whatever type of lighting you have, pick it out of this list, and then adjust it. And then when you select it in your white balance setting, it will remember that adjustment. Now, if we come down here to preset, 
this is where what you can do, where you can create your preset image. Measure allows you to um, take the to measure the white balance, and then use photo allows you to select a photo from your CF card to use to create your white balance setup. So that's that's how that works. Other than that, and then in auto, we can we can increase the amount of auto white balancing, decrease the amount of auto white balancing, however you see fit. Next up is ISO. It's the exact same thing as hitting this ISO button here that we saw in the second video. And we can select between 200 and 1600 in third stop increments. So 2 to 250, 250 to 320, 320 to 400. That's, those are what are called third stop increments. 250 is a third of the way between 200 and 400. 320 is two thirds of the way. And then 200 to 400 is a full stop. And that's everything in the shooting menu. Next up, we're going to come to the custom setup menu, and this is on manual page 135. So before you go through this set this menu with me, uh, if you want to follow along with this full video manual, what you want to do is go to your setup menu, which is the wrench tab. It's the next one down. So we're going to go there right now. And you want to go to the fourth item, CSM menu and you want to select detailed. If you select simple, you're going to have fewer options in the CSM menu that we're about to go through. So you want to have detailed to see all of the options. Honestly, I have no idea why they put this here instead of just putting it at the top of the CSM menu. I really, I'm, ne I'm never going to understand that. Okay, anyway, let's go through the CSM menu and we're going to start off with beep up at the top, if I can find it. There we go. So beep is actually the first, uh, no, reset, I'm sorry. Menu reset is the first item. Menu reset will allow you to come in and reset all of this configuration. So if you've just gotten this camera and you want to start over on setting everything up, reset these configurations first. I'm not going to do that because I have set these up already. <laughs> beep is simply on or off. Do you want the camera to give you audio feedback as you do things that indicate different stuff is happening, like focus is confirmed and so on and so forth? If you're in a place where you want to have quiet, such as a muse museum or your kids play or something, you definitely want to set this to off. I also, just as a general rule, would say set it to off because your camera will be less distracting to the people around you. This next item is autofocus, and these are your autofocus modes, AFS or AFC. What those mean are autofocus servo and autofocus continuous. Servo means that once the camera obtains focus, it will hold that focus point. Continuous means it will track moving subjects. Servo is very good for portraits. If you're doing a big corporate portrait shoot and you want to have all of your subjects be in the exact same focus, just have them sit there, autofocus servo, focus locks, take the picture, you're good to go. Autofocus continuous is really good if you're doing a like your kid's soccer game, right? And they're running around the field and you need to have your autofocus tracking your kid as they run. The next up is autofocus area mode and we have a few different options here. Single area, dynamic area and closest closest subject it would help if i read these before i move to them anyway single area is going to give you a small area in the center of your frame that is used for focusing this is the sort of thing that if you're doing a corporate portrait shoot this would be a really good option you just set up this so that your subject's face is in the single area and everybody will be focused at the same point Dynamic area will allow the focus area to change just a bit. Now, the way that dynamic area works is that there are five autofocus areas inside of the viewfinder, center, you know, and then one on each side. With dynamic area, you can still only use one, but you can use the cross pad to change your dynamic area. So you can select which of those five autofocus points you want. And what that will allow you to do is, let's say you want to, again, do that corporate portrait 
photo shoot, but instead of only using the center focus point, you want to use one off to the side so you can better use your frame. You can do that with dynamic area. So that's a good use of that. Another option would be like, let's say you're at a basketball game. You can set your focus off to the side, put the hoop right here, and then every time someone slam dunks on that hoop, you can have that hoop and them be in focus when you take the photos. Last up is closest subject, and the way that closest subject works is your autofocus is going to use the, the distance information you know, that the lens provides to figure out what, what thing is closest that could potentially be a subject, select that, and it's good to go. And this will use all five of the focus points at once. So it's a matter of personal preference, what you wanna use with this camera. I think dynamic area is probably the best and then manually setting the focus point that you want. Next up is autofocus assist on or off. And what this does is with on, the focus point that you're using is darker than the ones you're not. So it just lets you know which focus point is being active. ISO auto on or off. Do you want to have automatic ISO control with this camera? Do you want to be able to set that? What's weird is it's on here and there was no auto ISO option that I could find when we went into ISO. So I don't know why that was doing that unless it's a JPEG only function. Auto ISO though, we can now here go down here and we can select either done, which finishes what we're doing, or we can select some, uh, some uh, program aperture priority and DVP mode, which I'm not sure what DVP stands for. That must be, maybe that shouldn't be full auto. Anyway, I'm not sure what DVP mode is because I do not remember DVP mode from the mode dial, um, but you can select uh, an automatic I think this is slowest shutter speed to use with your ISO control. Honestly, not a function I've ever used on this camera, so it's a little bit foreign. Next is no CF card, okay, or release locked. So release locked or enable release. Basically what this is with release locked, if there's no CF card in the camera, you cannot take a photo. With release enabled, the camera will pretend to take a photo. If you want to check really quickly on your way out the door before you go that you did put a, a CF card in, set this to locked and turn it on, try to take a photo. If it won't take a photo, double check to make sure you have a CF card in there. Image review, off or on. Do you want to see your images playback after you take them? Yes or no? This is a matter of battery preservation and personal preference. If you are here learning how to become a better photographer with this camera, I'm going to recommend leaving this to off and forcing yourself not to look at your images until you get home, unless you have a really important one you want to play back and check, because that will let you, that will make you a better photographer. If you make mistakes in the field and your images don't turn out and you don't find that out until you get home, you will learn a harder lesson than if you just take another one right then. Next up is grid display on or off. Do you want to have the grid in the viewfinder on or off? Matter of personal preference and what you want to see. I like to see them. It helps keep your vertical lines vertical and your horizontals horizontal. And it's a really good framing aid because it's a rule of thirds grid. So, but if you don't want that distraction in your viewfinder, just turn it off. EV steps, one third or one half. Now, if you saw when we, or if you remember when we talked about ISO, I said, well, 200 to 250 is a third of a stop. This is where we set that. If you didn't have, if you set to one half stop, you could do 200 to 300 to 400 ISO, 400 to 550, 550, 650, 400 to 650 to 800, I think is what it is. Um, also, this affects your aperture stops and your shutter speed stops. In shooting raw, realistically, this doesn't matter that much because uh, you have a lot of control over raw. If you're shooting JPEG, this does matter a little bit more. So with raw shooters, this is probably just a matter of how quickly you want to scroll through settings. With JPEG shooters, it's a matter of how accurate you want your JPEG images to be. Exposure compensation on or off. What this does is with off, exposure compensation can um, must be done with the exposure compensation button on the top of the camera that we saw a few different times in the second video. With on, 
exposure compensation is done automatically if you use the front command wheel. So if you're a full manual shooter or if you're shooting aperture priority mode with the front command wheel set to control your aperture, this is on is not a good option for you because you'll get exposure value compensation control. But if you shoot exclusively in program mode, then setting this to on and using the front command wheel for EV comp could be a really good use of that setup. The next one is center weighted area size. So if you remember from the second video, we talked about the 8.3 millimeter center weighted area, and I tell you how to change it. We are now at that point in history. So with the center weighted area, there are four different options, six, eight, 10, and 12 millimeters. That's the diameter. And it is how big of a space do you want to have the center weighted area be? Matter of personal preference and how you like to shoot. If you shoot center weighted a lot and want it to perform a lot like an averaging meter, then you want to go with 12 millimeters. If you want it to be a bit more persnickety and function sort of like a semi spot meter, then you want to go with six. So total, totally how you want this camera to behave, it's up to you. Next up we have bracket set. And your options are AE flash, AE flash, or white balance. Basically what this does is this, when you bracket something, if you have a proper meter reading of 1 1 25th of a second at F5.6, and you bracket, you might go 1 60th, 1 1 25th, 1 2 50th. Too much light, just enough, too little, okay? Or F4.5, F5, sorry, F4, F5.6, F8. Too much light, just enough, too little or combinations thereof if you're in program mode. You can also use your flash to bracket. 1 1 25th at F5.6 with half power, full power, 2x power on your flash or something like that, right? And that would have the same basic effect for bracketing. So if you use flash a lot and you want to use flash with your bracketing, this is a good option. If you never use flash, then it, or if you use flash a lot, but you want to have strict control over the flash output and only have bracketing be done with aperture and shutter speed, you want to select AE only. If you are very, very particular about your depth of field and shutter speed, and you want to still be able to bracket, and you're using a flash, you can have this set so that only flash power will be used to adjust exposure levels for bracketing. And then white balance will turn on white balance bracketing so that what happens is when you use is that when you have your white balance it brackets different levels of that white balance so honestly i've never really used i've never found a use for white balance bracketing but the other three up here are really good in different scenarios and depending on the type of control that you want to have with your bracketing next up is bracket order and your bracket orders are uh, metered under over. So that's what they call normal. So if you're, if you have three brackets, right? 1 60th, 1 1 25th, and 1 2 50th, this would be 1 1 25th, 1 2 50th, um, 1 60th for the, for this order right here. Here would be under metered over, which would be 1 2, 1 2 50th, 1 1 25th, 1 60th. So basically it's a matter of when you get your photos back and you look at them on your computer, how do you want the bracketed photos to display? Proper exposure first with under and then over or under proper over. For me, it's this one because it makes it really easy to find a bracketed sequence and uh, I can also find the beginning and the end of it very simply. So, but it's what you want to see on your computer and a matter of personal preference for how you set this. Next up is command dial, yes or no. So with no, the main dial operates the shutter and the rear is for aperture, okay? So, so no sets the front dial to control your shutter speed and the rear dial controls your aperture setting. Um, with yes, the front dial controls aperture and the rear dial controls shutter speed. I prefer this way because if it's ever a question of which one controls which, the shutter is located in the back of the camera, the aperture is located in the front of it, the rear wheel controls the shutter speed in the back of the camera, the front wheel controls the aperture in the front of it. It's just a very easy way for, for me to remember what controls what. But matter of personal preference and what type of camera system you used coming to this camera because you know, uh, 
Minolta was different than Pentax, different than Nikon and Canon, and they some there were some variations in there. So, at any rate, A E L A F L button. So if you remembered in the second video, I said we'd talk about this button up here in the third video and how to adjust the settings. We are at that point. <clears throat> so here are your options. AEL, AFL, so auto exposure and auto focus lock, auto exposure lock only, auto focus lock only, auto exposure lock hold, and auto focus on. Okay, with this first option, pressing the AEL, AFL button will lock both the exposure settings and the focus. And it works like a light switch. Press it once to lock, press it a second time to unlock. The second setting here locks only the auto exposure settings. Press it once to lock, press it a second time to lock. Third locks only the, sorry, second locks, locks exposure, third locks focus. Focus lock, press it once to lock focus, press it a second time to unlock focus. And then this is your auto exposure only, but you have to hold the AEL button the entire time and release it when you want, and as soon as you release it, auto exposure will turn back on. And then the last option makes this the work like the autofocus on and off button, which um, basically what this does is this turns the AEL AFL button into a button that, that activates and disactivates your autofocus. Press it to turn autofocus on and track something or focus on a point, release it and go back to and turn off autofocus so focus won't shift. And this takes that function away from the shutter button. So if you're used to using rear camera button focus autofocus, AF on is the setting that you want. So in these four, there are different settings when they would be good or bad. If you lock your exposure and your autofocus, then you have a subject running from left to right, from dark to bright. You're going to have some images that are properly in focus, in focus and properly exposed, and some that will be properly in focus and way blown out. So this is good if you have a stationary subject or a subject moving horizontally in fixed lighting. Auto exposure lock is really good if you have fixed lighting, but say a moving subject. So if you're outdoors in full sun watching your kid play football or something, right, you can lock your exposure settings so that those, so you could take a sequence of photos that have all the exact same exposure settings, but the focus point would still track your kid as he carries the football across the, the goal line. Auto focus lock is very useful if you have a stationary subject in different lighting. So if you're doing, let's say, a studio shoot and you are taking photos of the same person, they're stationary, but you're going to try eight different lighting setups in succession, then you can lock your focus and have it stay locked by with the toggle switch of the AEL AFL button. And then focus won't change, but your auto exposure will change each time you do a different lighting setup. And then AE lock hold will allow you to lock the exposure settings as long as you hold the button. This way you have instant control if you need to change your settings quickly because the lighting changes quickly by just releasing the auto exposure lock button. So it's a matter of personal preference and shooting settings and what you want to do with this button as to which one of these you choose. AE lock. So with AEL AFL button, the, so right here with this option, the auto exposure lock button that we just covered in the previous section functions as we discussed in the previous section. If you set this to on plus shutter or yeah, it would be, this would be called plus release button, which is your auto exposure lock button plus the shutter button. The, the shutter button will also perform auto exposure lock when it's half pressed with this selection you only get auto exposure lock with the AEL button right up here. With this selection, you get auto exposure lock with either the AEL button or the shutter button. So a matter of personal preference, which one you want for this. Focus area is going to be on or off. Basically, wrap or no wrap. You have the five focus points in your viewfinder. So if you are over here on this side and you want to get over here, do you want to push right twice or left once? So if you think of video games and the world map wrapping as you travel around the world map, 
This is the world wraps. On this one, there are invisible walls at the end of the world, so if you're over here, you have to scroll all the way across your viewfinder in order to get to that, that other autofocus point. Totally a matter of personal preference and how you want your camera to behave. Next up is autofocus area illumination, and your options are auto, off, and on, okay? So with auto, way up here, if your scene is dark, the, the, the place you are taking a photo in is dark, the autofocus points will illuminate. With off, they will never illuminate. And with on, they will always illuminate. This is just a matter of personal preference and how you want your camera to communicate information with you. So whatever you're most comfortable with, go for it. Next is going to be your flash mode. Now we did cover this in the second video in depth. So if you're here to learn th that, go check out the second video for the flash section of that video. There's a link in the description of that video and that this will, uh, you can learn everything about this. So we're just gonna cover this quickly through the lens metering for your flash, full manual control of your flash, full manual control of your flash and it controls the other flashes in a multi-flash setup. That's what that means. Flash sign, this we also covered in the second video but it's pretty quick, on or off. With on, if you are in program, shutter priority, aperture priority, or full manual mode, you will get an indicator in your viewfinder if the flash needs to be used to give you a proper exposure. With off, you will not. This is simply a matter of what kind of information you want from your camera and how you want your camera to communicate with you. Shutter speed, this is the last of the flash setups that are really detailed in the second video, but basically this is the slowest shutter speed that your camera will use in an automatic program mode or semi-automatic aperture and shutter priority modes when using a flash. It will use the fastest speed up to the 1 500th of a second sync speed or down to as slow as 1 60th or even as slow as 30 seconds. This is just a matter of how you want your camera to behave when you're using a flash and the types of settings that you're using a flash in. The next option here is monitor off. And this is simply how long until this LCD screen turns off, 10 seconds up to 10 minutes. This is strictly a matter of battery preservation and how long you want your camera's LCD screen to stay on when you're working in the menus. Obviously making videos like this, it would be kind of hard to do if it was turning off every 10 seconds. Very annoying to, uh, to have that happen. I speak from experience on that uh, at any rate. But generally speaking, when I'm doing a camera that I'm not making a video about, I'll usually set it to five minutes, sometimes one, depending on wh whether it's a camera with a big battery or a small battery. So this is a matter of personal preference and battery uh, capacity. Next is meter off, and this is how long your light meter stays on after you have to press the shutter button. Is it going to be four seconds up to 30 minutes? Well, 16 seconds, or 30 minutes. There's no in between 16 seconds and 30 minutes. I generally go with 16 seconds on a camera. I find that's a good time for the shutter, for the meter to stay on. There's not a huge battery drain with the light meter staying on. So this is really just a matter of personal preference and how long you want your light meter to stay active after you have to press the shutter button. Next up is self timer. In the first video, I think it was the first video I talked about the, or second video rather, I talked about the, the shooting modes and self timer and said it's 10 seconds and we can change it. And we'll see it in the third video. And this is now that point. So self timer can go from two seconds to 20 seconds at these four presets. And this is just a matter of selecting how long you want your self timer to be on for. If you're gonna do a bunch of studio photography and you don't wanna wait 10 seconds every time you shut, push the button, but you do know you need to have a little bit of a delay so that after you push the shutter button, your camera can stop shaking, then you might want to go with two or five seconds. But if you're going to be out and you're going to be taking a photo of yourself and you've got to run like the Dickens to get out in front of the uh, photo so that you can be in the frame where you want to be, but that's a long run, you might want to set this to 20 seconds so that you can get out there and get into position before the photo is taken. And then remote is the next option. This is how long your remote control sensor will stay on. So if you know that the uh, remote control is gonna be used, will it stay on for one minute up to 15 in these increments? This is a matter of personal preference. I don't think that the IR port's gonna drain the battery that much, but if you know that you're, you don't need it to have it on for 15 minutes, you might only need it. You're gonna be taking a photo every say 30 seconds or you're gonna get it set up, go and take a photo after a few moments. 
you might only need it on for one minute. This is just a matter of personal preference and how you want your camera to behave. And that is the end of the CSM menu. So the, the next and final menu is called the setup menu. And this is if you have your manual page 155 will take you through these different items. So we're going to come up here to folders. This is the first of the uh, options. And this allows you to select a folder from your CF card. I only have one, so we're going to go with that. You can also create a new folder or rename a folder. So let's say that you're going to be doing two photo shoots in a day for two different friends, right? You're going to, you're going to hang out, shoot some, one of your friend's graduations, and then you're going to go hang out with another friend and shoot a birthday party or whatever. Create a folder, graduation. Create another folder, birthday party. And then what you can do is take all the photos in that graduation folder, then switch over to the birthday party folder um, in, when you get there. And then you switch folders by going into select folder, right? So you create the new, you get to the graduation, select it. You finish the graduation, get to the birthday party. Then you go into and select the birthday party photo folder. So that's what that's for. File numbering sequence, on, off, or reset. Okay, so with this, if you leave it to off, every time you go into a new folder, it will start at photo 0001. Okay, that's this setting right here. If you go to file number sequence on, it will not reset when it goes into a new folder. So your graduation folder might be photo 0001 through 318. Then when you go into your birthday party photo, it will start at 319. This is the one I would recommend using because if you take all of those photos then and you get back to your computer and you dump them all in the same folder on your computer, you could overwrite some photos and that's always a risk for accidentally erasing some. It's a whole lot harder to overwrite photos if the numbering is higher than the number of photos that your CF card can hold. So definitely recommend leaving that to on. You could also manu manually reset to get back to 000. Format, pretty straightforward. Do you want to format the, C the CF card, yes or no? We're gonna, we're gonna hit okay and format the CF card because I don't need any of those photos anymore. CSM menu, we talked about at the very beginning of the CSM menu, and this is just, do you want the simple or the detailed CSM menu when you go into adjust custom settings? Date allows you to adjust the date and time. Wow, that is way off. Okay, so these old cameras, uh, they have batteries on the boards, like little button cell batteries that are used to remember the date and time. So if you take out the battery, the main battery, and the button cell is dead, like it is on this camera, uh, the, battery, the date's going to reset every single time you put a new battery in, which is what happened here. Anyway, you can manually reset the year, month, day, and hour of the, uh, the clock so that that's, that information is accurately stored in your EXIF data. LCD brightness goes from plus two to negative two, and this is strictly a matter of, well, battery preservation. Negative two is going to drain less battery, and what kind of settings you're shooting in. Plus two is really good for these videos because it gives me a brighter screen, and also for, like, let's say, outdoors and full sun. But minus two could be a whole lot better at a concert, right? So you can adjust the LCD screen brightness as needed. Next up is mirror lockup, and this is going to be yes or no. Okay, so what this does is with yes, you, this will lock up the mirror for cleaning. So press the shutter button. There we go. You can see in there that the, the mirror is now locked up, and if I wanted to, I could clean that sensor. When I'm done cleaning the sensor, clip it off, Clip it back on, and everything is reset. So that's what mirror lockup is for. And if you don't want a mirror lockup to clean, you just click no and back out of it. Video mode and TSC and PAL. Well, this is really weird because at the very beginning of the first video, I said you can't do video with this camera, it cannot record it, and that is correct. This is your video output port communication. So if you do have a 20-year-old analog TV that you can plug this camera into and you want to do that, if you're in, the, in North America, NTSC, if you're in a PAL region, you use PAL. Language, 
these are the different languages you can choose from English, French, Italian, Japanese, Korean, things like that. Um, and you can just pick which language you want to have your menu system be in. Image comment on uh, done, input, or attach comments. Basically, if you wanted to, if you had images, you could input comments. This does use a keyboard that you have to select each individual letter using the keypad. Um, kind of annoying if you have like a long comment. Honestly, I know this feature exists in a lot of cameras. I've used it exactly zero times in my life because it's just kind of cumbersome and a pain. USB is going to be uh, mass storage or peer-to-peer. -peer. When you use the, the USB mini one port on the side, when? Okay, yeah, let's pretend anyone's gonna do that. Do you want this to work as a mass storage or a peer-to-peer -peer device? If you're gonna transfer files at the rate of a byte a second through that or whatever the mini one USB speeds were, you want mass storage. Honestly, your best bet is going to be not to, just to pretend the USB port doesn't even exist on this camera. Pop your CF card in and out, buy a good CF card, your data transfer rates onto your computer with even an inexpensive CF card to modern computer reader will be way faster than a mini USB one port. Next up, we have dust reference photo. And what this does is this takes a photo that will record the dust spots on your sensor so that your camera can automatically edit those out of the raw files and you have less dust cloning to do in post. Firmware version, this is your current firmware version. And I do not have, I do not have the final versions written down in my notes, but I believe that that a firmware's A and B uh, 2.0 are the final versions for this camera. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, I think I remember up, upgrading this, updating this for this video to make sure I had these. Um, the links in the video description, yeah, I do have it. In the video description, there is a, a set of links. The last of those links will take you to Nikon's website where they have the firmware. So if you do not have 2.0, then you can upgrade to the final firmware. Uh, you know, assuming that they keep that up there, I don't see why they wouldn't. Image rotation on or off. Do you want your portrait orientation images to automatically rotate on the LCD screen and on your computer? matter of personal preference, uh, I think automatic, well, automatic or off. I tend to re go with automatic. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier to not crane my head around when looking at photos, right? Then that's it. That was the last of the items. And with that, everything on this camera. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you in whatever video manuals come next.